Hello, hello everyone. Today is the final um, session with me for the compress sensing uh, part of the cooperative communication systems uh, lectures for the summer semester 2020 at the Deutsche Telekom Chair of Communication Networks. Uh, this is Marwa Taguchi speaking. Um, in the following, we will be uh, correcting the exercises related for compress sensing. So let's just get started. We will uh, first start with task one, um, where the question is to define the support of a vector X. Uh, the support, uh, remember, is, uh, is actually a set that is defined by the indices of the uh, elements within uh, the vector that are non-zero. So next, um, why actually the term L0 is not actually accurate? And I think I covered this well in the, in the lectures part, but nevertheless, it's nice to remind that it's actually a cardinality function that has its definition in the form of an LP norm, where here the P is nothing than a zero. And of course, remember that um, for P varying from zero uh, to values uh, uh, close to one, we don't actually have the, uh, the uh, notion of, uh, of norm. So here, the L0 norm of our vector x is the cardinality of the support vector, uh, sorry, of the support set that we already uh, know how to calculate from the previous uh, question. And if we would like to bring this down to the way we write uh, norms in general, then um, we could use the same notion uh, for the norm, but here we have the zero, uh, the, sorry, the P is uh, uh, tending to be zero, and this would give us uh, just the um, sum of the non-zero element uh, in this, uh, no, sorry, the non-zero uh, element, uh, here referred to uh, uh, one, and uh, we calculate their sum, and this is how we obtain uh, the L0. Actually, this uh, writing is somehow equivalent uh, to the cardinal support that we uh, see before. Then we would like to give the support, and I apologize for this mistake, we give the support and the L0 norm uh, for X, uh, while well, X is uh, the, this specific vector and y and uh, and y is this one so simply support of x is nothing by the positions it's uh, at uh, position one and at position four uh, the non-zero elements and as for y position two and position three if i would like to calculate their support simply i will be uh, summing uh, the non-zero elements. Here we have two everywhere. And then the question is, uh, we would like to explain why the L0 norm is actually uh, difficult to compute. So we discussed previously that it, it requires an expensive searching a step in all the subspaces that we have inside the generally large vector space because you know, we are not uh, in compressed sensing, we don't deal with vectors of size three, four, uh, regular ones, but we deal with uh, generally very huge uh, vector spaces. So, if I would like to uh, do this L0 norm, then it will be done in an exponential time. And for example, if uh, my vector space is of a size uh, 1000 and with the sparsity just 10, then we would need to solve uh, the binom of uh, n and k uh, as you see here. 
and actually um, mathematically speaking we can uh, it is proved that uh, the binom of nk usually is larger or equal than the fraction of n over k power k here we have 10 power 20 so if we just stop there at 10 power 20 and uh, even if we could solve each of these uh, systems like individual systems uh, in uh, a time of 10 power uh, minus 10 seconds then we could still we would still need 10 power 10 seconds which is over 300 years to find the desired solution of course this is crazy and um, nobody would like to do it and this was maybe the first reason why we haven't seen uh, compressed sensing um, like in the previous, um, let's say, uh, ages and so. And that's why it's still uh, something new because previously it was just insane to think of uh, uh, solving such, uh, such systems simply. Okay, then now the next question we would like to define actually as an alternative solution uh, rather than this L0 and uh, solutions are usually adopted in compressed sensing and we need to explain uh, the choice. Of course, this was also uh, taken care of in, in the slides and uh, just to make it brief, you can easily substitute the L0 by L1. This was proved uh, nicely uh, by uh, Professor Candice uh, uh, and uh, well justified the need, the, sorry, the use for L1, also the use for L2, and there are of course other uh, type of um, type of uh, alternative solutions that have seen the light uh, since the appearance of this uh, L1 uh, equivalence that we get. So next, uh, we know that traditionally in linear algebra, a linear system of equation uh, uh, where y actually, or the number of equations are actually uh, lower than the uh, unknowns themselves. So um, does this system of equation have a solution? Um, yeah, it has a solution, but the solution is not unique. You can actually find an infinite number of solutions. And that, of course, <laughs> doesn't solve the issue. We, we kind of like still stuck. If we uh, uh, look at this uh, problem from a linear algebra, algebra point of view. So then we need to enumerate the conditions under which the above system can be solved. And I insist on the fact that uh, to make compressed sensing work, you need to have a sparsity or compressibility. And this means that my K has to be uh, efficiently or sufficiently smaller than N. And uh, our sensing matrix has to obey a certain property, uh, such as the VIP or uh, null space property or the uh, restricted eigenvalues and so on and so forth. <clears throat> and then, of course... <laughs> There is no compressed sensing uh, um, problem if we don't have less number of measurements than the signal, uh, original signal itself. And finally, of course, the level of sparsity has to be uh, still uh, smaller than uh, the number of measurements. And uh, this actually is really well detailed in the uh, first slides in the second lecture of compressed sensing. Um, that pretty much covers all the uh, details uh, one should know regarding uh, compressed sensing problems and whether we can solve them or not. So for task number two, we consider the transmission of an image uh, and we treat an image here as a, or any higher dimensional uh, signal or data by vectorizing it into a long one-dimensional vector x. Uh, in R and uh, vector space. So we need to define the representation theta of x in terms of an orthonormal basis. Actually, theta is nothing than a sparse representation of x. Uh, 
that we've seen in the lecture, and an orthonormal basis uh, psi, uh, where the vectors psi one, uh, where it has vectors psi one up to psi n uh, of dimension uh, n. So, what is here the relationship between x and theta? Uh, remember that we said uh, that a signal in general uh, admits a, a sparse representation in an orthonormal or orthogonal or close to the orthogonal basis or a frame or a, or a dictionary. Uh, here we are like in a perfect situation. We have an orthonormal, orthonormal basis. So simply we need to do a certain projection and pro projection means we need to calculate uh, the dot product between uh, uh, x and the rows of um, and the rows of uh, uh, the orthonormal basis uh, psi, and that's how we obtain theta one, theta two, until theta n, and theta is the projection of x in this orthonormal basis. So knowing that x is a k sparse in the basis. Uh, psi, for which k actually we can apply the compressed sensing technique. Please remember that k has to be um, smaller than m and uh, smaller than n. So like the smallest uh, parameter here, here we have in a compressed sensing uh, problem is actually k. So then um, name three inefficiencies when using the sample, then compress uh, framework, uh, which is this traditional uh, compression based on Shannon sampling, uh, Shannon Nyquist sampling rate. Uh, the three inefficiencies, like there are a lot of inefficiencies, but that came across my mind when writing this. Uh, first of all, uh, the initial number of samples n may be actually large, even if the desired k is small, just like measuring unnecessary uh, data. Second, the set of all n transform coefficients, they must be computed even though all but k of them uh, will be discarded. So, waste of computation, and transmission, and so on. And finally, the location of the large coefficients or the non-zero coefficients must be encoded. We need to know where they are placed um, because remember we have the problem of the L0 norm. We have a problem of where the non-zero coefficients are actually placed within a coefficient. Uh, and this will introduce a, a higher overhead, which we don't want to. Because the point was to compress, reduce the data size, not bring in something uh, extra, uh, like here a certain overhead. So, of course, the alternative was um, some technique like compressed sensing, which breaks with the traditional uh, algebra and the Shannon Nyquist theory. And you can read more about it in the lectures, of course. So here we consider a general uh, linear measurement process that computes m, which is smaller than n, inner products between x and a collection of vectors here. The, these vectors are actually uh, vectors of the sensing matrix, um, where the size is um, like we have m vectors, m is smaller than n, and uh, a vector itself is of a size n. And we have this uh, dot uh, product. We need to define analytically y. So y is the collection of these uh, scalars that we obtained uh, by multiplying x with uh, phi g. And uh, yeah, the, like nothing fancy, y is uh, uh, nothing by phi x. And uh, x, of course, remember we wrote it as uh, theta, uh, sorry, psi theta. And this is the final uh, writing. Okay, so explain why non-adaptive measurements are actually sufficient for the recovery. So we know that this um, phi is actually fixed and it could be used in different compressed sensing uh, problems, regardless of the 
data or the type of data that you uh, have. All we care about is that this specific file has to obey the um, RIP property at least, or simply it has to be drawn, for example, from a Gaussian distribution or a Bernoulli distribution. And this actually does not depend on the signal. That's why non-adaptive measurements are, are okay uh, to recover uh, or to reconstruct our original signal. Thanks. Okay, so how can the receiver recover X knowing that we have, like the, here the unknown is X, and the known, the known elements or parameters that we have are Y, Psi, and Phi. Uh, of course, here we have uh, an optimization uh, problem that, of course, is simply we can reconstruct it using uh, uh, one of the compressed sensing reconstruction algorithms. And the easiest way to answer this question would be to use the L0 minimization uh, that we see. We need to uh, minimize the L0 uh, norm of x uh, subject to y equals uh, phi x. But of course, there exists a large set of algorithms for solving such an optimization problem, uh, like greedy algorithms and so on. So, uh, task three. Here we talk about the Spark that was uh, um, taken part of lecture two, and um, it's actually a very nice way of calculation. Uh, uh, for uh, compressed sensing, it's something really fun, and I like to uh, introduce it for uh, uh, students for exercises. So we've seen that this park is a, uh, the, or a cruise call rank of the matrix uh, is the smallest number of columns of A that are linearly dependent, and the spark of an of A could be uh, varying between the scalar from one to n. Or simply the could be the infinity. And um, when we talk of a spark infinity or some other, actually they note it as uh, n plus one. So infinity or n plus one or something that is larger than the uh, uh, maximum uh, size within a, a matrix and dimension. Um, yeah, so, but uh, for me, I think a plus infinity makes more sense. Uh, uh, it's more logical. So if I'm having a spark that tends to the infinity or equals the infinity, then here we talk about a full rank matrix and uh, the rank here is uh, equal to N. And, uh, of course, this is an equivalent uh, situation. So if I'm having rank a, rank equals n, of course, my spark would be uh, equals to the infinity. And if my spark equals 1, uh, then um, actually my matrix A has a zero column. So, yeah, I mean, it is dependent with itself, let's say. So that's why uh, it could equal one. There is no other situation for that. And if my spark in general is uh, not equal to the infinity or n plus one, this takes me uh, to the situation uh, where uh, spark A is actually smaller or equal to the rank plus one. So, here, the matrix can never be of uh, uh, can never be full rank. So here, it cannot be an n. And uh, of course, if it's not full rank, then uh, my spark uh, is not the infinite infinity, and uh, and the plus one. Um, yeah, and uh, I mean they are um, integers, so uh, so it could it should be like uh, smaller than this rank uh, plus one to get the uh, tight. Um, 
how to say it in English. Yeah, the tight form in my inequality. Um, so now B, let sigma k uh, be the set of all um, of all k sparse uh, signals x uh, in R n, where we define this uh, uh, sigma k as uh, the vectors uh, axes such that their uh, zero norm is smaller or equal than k. So we explain what does this set form for n uh, equals uh, 3 and k equal 2. Here we um, here we draw uh, and like the normal example of uh, the traditional coordinates uh, for x, y, and z. And uh, here the options are uh, something like you discard uh, the x, uh, the x coordinates, and you will end up with having the uh, y and z, and, and so on. So in total, if you just um, like check this manually, you will see that you will end up with only three positions each time discarding uh, only something. So the set of the sparse signals uh, sigma k does not form uh, a linear space. It actually consists of uh, a their union or union of all the possible uh, subspaces that we obtain by calculating the uh, binom between n and k. And um, in this specific case, uh, if we change uh, n for 3 and k for 2, then uh, all the subspaces sigma 2 that are uh, included in R3 uh, are actually the set of all two sparse uh, signal or hyperplan in uh, R3. And in this case, uh, like when you calculate using this uh, uh, this binom, you end up having uh, three possible solutions. So either you check it manually or uh, uh, with this uh, this way. So finally. What is the impact uh, of large n on the algorithmic uh, complexity? So for larger values of n and k, and, uh, as I mentioned, we don't usually deal in compressing with small values, but rather big ones. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, for larger values of n and k, we must consider a potentially huge number of subspaces. Of course, um, you need, as I showed the example in uh, task one, of course, this will be uh, have very significant algorithmic uh, consequences uh, when you want to uh, recover the um, original signal. It might take a lifetime. Okay. So now, uh, task four. So we have a matrix A uh, in uh, in R um, N. N. So here uh, we don't have a, like our matrix cannot be non-singular, um, but uh, its rank uh, should be the minimum between like maximum rank would be the minimum between M and N. So here we would like to know the null space, or also called kernel of A. So as simple as it is, the null space of uh, uh, matrix A is usually denoted by kernel or care A equals um, the uh, like the vectors x in R n uh, such that uh, if I multiply in my matrix A by this vector x, we obtain a zero vector. So when A equals this matrix, 
uh, we need to sketch the solution set of the linear system of equation AX36 and uh, mark all uh, one sparse solutions. So I think the solution is really uh, trivial here to, to calculate. And you can already notice that uh, the first column, uh, sorry, the second column is nothing than uh, um, uh, like a multiplication of the first column by two. So that's how we obtain uh, sparse solutions. Uh, but it could be maybe a good idea for those who didn't uh, Done. A, didn't do any matrix multiplication for some time to uh, refresh a little bit. Okay, so now the final question to this task. Let A, this matrix, which is uh, 4 by 3 uh, uh, matrix. So using A as a sensing matrix to get measurements of the four, uh, Y equals AX. Is it possible to recover all one sparse vectors x from y without like having an ambiguity or uh, means like I'm having uh, two um, solutions? Uh, how to say? Like uh, one solution mapping to the to two different. Uh, uh, possibilities or so. So I, I have to make sure that the solution is somehow unique. So the hint here is to calculate it uh, using a spark. Uh, our matrix is small, so a spark, calculating a spark is not a, a difficult task uh, for uh, small matrices. Um, just like the rank, if my matrix is very small, then it's easy to calculate it or if uh, the structure of the matrix uh, coefficients is somehow uh, unknown, then, uh, uh, sorry, is known, then it's easy to calculate the rank or as well the spark. So we determine the spark using the columns of A that we define in, uh, in the following. And unless I'm uh, uh, wrong, uh, I noticed only that uh, C1 and uh, C2, uh, sorry, C3 uh, actually equals zero. So here the task is to find all these uh, columns combinations uh, that would lead me to a zero vector. So yeah, mm, I think C1 plus C3 would just give me zero everywhere. And because of that, I uh, would conclude that uh, the spark of the matrix A is equal to. And uh, of course, this is the minimum size of a linearly dependent set of columns of A. And here we have, um, like as a next step, uh, we calculate the, the L0 uh, norm of X. Uh, it's like it should be smaller than uh, spark A divided by 2. And if the system uh, Y equals AX has a, a solution uh, uh, X, which actually satisfies uh, this inequality, then the solution is uh, the sparsest. And uh, here we have uh, the the and a, a norm of the norm zero of x is equal one, so we have a one sparse vector. Okay, we move to task uh, five, and here uh, we want to calculate uh, the kernel of the matrix A. Um, so, as we said, this kernel of uh, of a matrix, you take the matrix, you multiply by uh, the, these vectors. Here we are in R3, so X, Y, Z, and it has to be equal to, uh, to zero. And of course, this uh, type of writing, we can simply um, 
write it as a standard uh, linear system of equations uh, like this, or if I'm trying to uh, solve it uh, using uh, a Gaussian elimination, then uh, remember we used to um, we used to write the coefficients part here, and here we put the expected the, the solution or sorry result of the equation here. Here we have zero, so that's it. And uh, we do a tri triangulation step, and uh, at the end, like the, our calculation would stop uh, here, and. Therefore, if I'm uh, exporting this to my uh, system of equation, then I will end up having my x equals uh, uh, minus 1 over 16 of z, and my y is, um, is equal minus 13 of, uh, over 8 of z. So both of the vectors, they are written using the vector z. So, generally speaking, an element of the kernel uh, can be expressed as uh, C, the scalar, uh, minus uh, 1 over 16, minus 13 over 8, and 1. So, this is a vector of my kernel. Of course, you can polish it or just multiply uh, by 16 to retrieve, uh, uh, like, a um, uh, integers and uh, yeah of course here c is a scalar so therefore the kernel of a is exactly the solution set of the aforementioned equations that we've seen and the vector uh, minus 1 minus 26 16 or simply this one uh, is a basis of the kernel of A, and the nullity here of A is uh, 1. So now we would like to prove that the vectors in the kernel A are actually orthogonal to each other, or each other to each of the row uh, vectors uh, of A. So, like, uh, seen differently, we would like to take the vectors of the kernel and we would like to check if they are orthogonal to each of the vectors or row vectors of A. So as simple as uh, I take the, the vector, uh, my basis of the kernel and I multiply with the first row. Uh, of course here I'm not doing um, like the normal uh, uh, multiplication of uh, of matrices. That's why uh, the result is a scalar. Here we are doing a dot product or inner product, and I'm multiplying element-wise. Then I'm summing all the stuff, and I obtain a zero. I will do the same for the second um, row of A, and I will still get zero. So you can you could please uh, try at home. Uh, this calculation and check maybe I'm wrong in, in, in this, which actually I doubt <laughs> because the result uh, they actually uh, results they actually make sense. Okay, Luke. So finally, uh, we have this task uh, six that is a little bit challenging. Maybe if uh, your background is a little bit far from linear algebra in general. Uh, that's why I didn't want to include it in this exam, uh, in the exam for this year, because I didn't have the chance to chat with you and uh, know the level in general, um, whether you like such kind of exercises or not. That's why I decided uh, not to include it in the exam. And to be honest, um, it's very tough for me to uh, read all these uh, mathematical symbols in, in, in English, so I would leave it for you to uh, give a try at home and uh, check the, the solution. And if there is any, uh, how to say, ambiguity or questions, of course, you can always write me and we can even have an online session 
to discuss this exercise or any other uh, exercises uh, that you have um, that you want to clarify. But I hope at least uh, that um, these exercises were somehow simple, um, but could bring a, a bit of information regarding compressed sensing. I know that two lectures is not uh, enough, but uh, I, I try to find uh, suitable exercises uh, for that. Okay, so that's pretty much it. And uh, please do not forget that uh, we also have in the channel, uh, we have the the video regarding uh, the book chapter uh, 22 of the of our, of our comments book it's about uh, compressed sensing and there you could play around with the uh, framework and you could try different uh, examples and you can just change parameters to really embrace uh, what compressed sensing is, because these exercises, of course, you have to do manually, even for the exam. You have to do something uh, feasible in a certain amount of time, knowing that you are not using any calculator or uh, software during the exam. So uh, that's why we use small uh, numbers. But if you really would like to see the impact uh, of compressed sensing or its um, its benefits when uh, we are using it in larger sets, then please go check the the video uh, of the chapter 22. Okay, so thank you very much. Please uh, do not hesitate to write to me anytime until the exam. And um, as I said, and I repeat it again, please, if you want an online session uh, where we discuss these exercises or any other exercises of your choice, uh, please let me know uh, and write me on my email. Okay, thank you very much and wish you all the best for the exam and for the rest of also your exams. Um, and have a good day. Bye-bye.